Before we get started on today's topic, YouTube blocked last week's video that I made because it's about the movie Training Day, so it had clips from Training Day in it. I uploaded it somewhere else instead, so you can watch it at the link in the description. And that's where you'll be able to find me if I ever get kicked off YouTube. Also, I'd like to recognize today's sponsor, So Long Fresh. <laughs> Are you tired of fresh food like fruit and vegetables? Me too. That's why I called So Long Fresh. So Long Fresh brings me all the candy and processed crap that I want to my door whenever I want it. Thanks, So Long Fresh. Everyone wants to make things better. Well, everyone except the people at the top making them worse. But for most of us, we want to make things better, but we don't know where to start. The world has so many problems, and they're so big and complex, they seem overwhelming. How would you stop Putin's war on Ukraine, for example, or Saudi's war on Yemen? I don't know either, folks. I think telling the facts is a good start, which is why I made this video and why this channel exists, because awareness and understanding are key, but without acting on them, they don't solve anything. And yet humans have proven that we can do just about anything if we work together. But there are forces keeping us apart. We've already been divided and conquered. There are nation-states with laws and borders that stop us from going anywhere else to help or letting people move so they can seek help. Modern border regimes even tightly restrict our ability to send aid. There are racism and nationalism, which infect entire cultures with needing to know where someone is from and what they look like before we know if we should care what happens to them. What happened in the last refugee crisis in Europe back in 2015, Poland was one of the EU countries that you know, was hesitant to take in refugees. Talk about what has changed and the different position now. Yeah, well, just to put it bluntly, these are not refugees from Syria. These are refugees from uh, neighboring Ukraine. I mean, that, quite frankly, is part of it. These are um, Christians, they're white, they're, um, they're very similar to people, many people who live in Poland. And there are always new forms of bigotry, like how the conservative world has recently heard about the existence of trans people and now is doing their best to exclude them from public life entirely. There are media that encourage all these forces of division. There's the belief in the law, as if it were always morally correct to accept everything the state writes down, to ask the state for permission to do anything and fear anyone the state has judged guilty. We need to be constantly at odds with these forces, at, at least undermining them intellectually, at least in our own heads. If you grew up under the rule of a state, you have been indoctrinated in all these ideas, and you should clean out the attic of your mind. Solidarity is a result of realizing everyone deserves the same freedom and justice. So what is solidarity? It's when we treat other people's struggles for liberation as equal to our own. You might even say it's to recognize their struggle is our struggle, that social problems are linked with common causes, victims, and beneficiaries. Solidarity is about identifying and undermining sources of oppression and aiding the people fighting or escaping it. Who deserves our solidarity? Is it only people similar to us? No, and in fact, it's the mark of solidarity that you don't care that they're different from you. You want to help them all the same. Do people need to be clean and sober to be allowed food and shelter? Do people need to pledge allegiance to your country before they should be allowed in? What if the people have been charged with a crime? I don't care. They still need support. 
If it's a really serious crime, maybe we can help them atone for it and reconcile with their victims, rather than automatically excluding everyone carrying a stigma. On this channel, I focus mostly on systems of oppression, analyzing and understanding them so you can have an understanding of a complex system enough to know what's wrong with it. But if you don't have that understanding yet, you can still do the work of solidarity. Mutual aid is the practice of solidarity. And mutual aid is a really big topic, so why not check out this video and St. Andrew will tell you all about it. So what can you do to start? Let solidarity be your principle. Who needs it most? Homeless people? Refugees? People with trauma? People in prison? People fighting for their land? People fighting for their lives? The answer is yes to all of them, of course. So who's organizing near you? What are the most pressing issues around you? What do you know about? How can you help? I've said several times on this channel, if you live in North America, and probably anywhere if you're white, your organizing priority should be to work with black, brown, and indigenous people, because they're clearly the most oppressed, and for that reason, they're doing the most to fight back. You don't need to be a leader. They already have leaders. Just find people working on decolonization, anti-racist or anti-fascist organizing, and they'll show you what to do. Organizing shouldn't center whiteness and white people's feelings or straight people or able-bodied people. And if organizers have no use for you, don't take it personally. Beyond prioritizing decolonial work, I'd say be a little careful whom you ally with. Your time and energy are limited. Some leftists come with somewhat different biases than everyone else. They might refuse solidarity with people from one or another country in the name of anti-imperialism. They'll erase victims in solidarity with states, which isn't solidarity, but elitism and authoritarianism. Some people will declare themselves open to working with anyone, which sounds good, but if you're working with people who have different goals from you, you will come into conflict. When you're a part of the left, the so-called left, you hear about left unity. The idea is all the disparate elements that can be called the left, from social democrats to Marxists to anarchists, should unite against the common enemy, capitalism. Hey, that's all well and good in the abstract. And is it ever abstract? <laughs> I'm on Twitter a lot, and whenever someone tweets about unity and chides different groups for not wanting to work together, there's rarely any context. Work together how? Towards whose goals? What if you don't think their work is making measurable progress on the goals you want to pursue? If we were under more pressure, like if we were living under an obvious foreign occupation, it might be easier to unite to fight it off. But in a place like the US or Canada, which are so-called liberal democracies, how exactly does the enemy of free people manifest itself? Is it the state only? The corporation? The school? The media? The banks? The whole idea of private property? social hierarchy itself? Because I would say it's all those things, and undermining any of them is worth doing. But not everyone agrees. And how do you organize to stop those things? Big organizations have a bunch of weaknesses and are not really suitable to the work of revolution, in my opinion at least, as many of them only empower the people at the top, and can be easily infiltrated by law enforcement or fascists. You're not building the vanguard party that's going to lead the revolution, okay? That is a fantasy that realistic people should not spend their time on. Check the history of these organizations to see where they get their money from, if they've covered up for abusers in their ranks, or if they've worked with bigots. 
nor would I consider it solidarity to use people's suffering and oppression as opportunities to build your own brand. A lot of anarchists form affinity groups, small groups of people with the same goal. You know, and trust each other, you're moving in the same direction, you keep your goals simple. That's what I recommend for now, at least until it's easier to organize in the open. There's a lot we can do in groups, just don't get caught. It's great if you have skills and experience you can bring to the table, but it's also okay if your abilities or time are limited. I once saw someone online say they felt useless because they couldn't really do anything to advance the revolution. I had a couple of objections to that. First, they were communicating online. That's something. We need people to do that. We need to spread facts and ideas and stem the constant flow of propaganda. You can lend your perspective. You can amplify marginalized voices. If you speak a language and have the opportunity, you can help. Don't worry that it's not much or it's not enough. Nothing any of us does will ever be enough. That's why we don't do it alone. As an individual, my power is next to nothing. As a group, we can do anything. But to continue to answer the question, more importantly, you don't need to contribute. You're valuable even if there's nothing you can do for others. You still belong. There are all kinds of theories of organizing that you could read about, but one that's been pretty effective is especifismo. Let's take a minute. Especifismo can be summarized in three points. One, the need for specifically anarchist organization built around a unity of ideas and praxis. Praxis means doing stuff. The use of the specifically anarchist organization to theorize and develop strategic political and organizing work. Three, active involvement in and building of autonomous and popular social movements which is described as social insertion. There are certain things anarchists focus on and certain methods they use that make it necessary for them to have their own organization, goals, and strategy. The program must come from a rigorous analysis of society and the correlation of the forces that are part of it. It must have as a foundation the experience of the struggle of the oppressed and their aspirations, and from those elements it must set the goals and the tasks to be followed by the revolutionary organization in order to succeed not only in the final objective, but also in the immediate ones. At the same time, what your affinity group does might not directly benefit marginalized people, so there's also a need for social insertion. Joining in the daily struggles of people, within movements of people struggling to better their own condition, which come together not always out of exclusively materially based needs, but also socially and historically rooted needs of resisting the attacks of the state and capitalism. In this article it includes uh, workers' movements, immigrants' communities, neighborhood organizations, students, poor and unemployed people forming their own movements. Can you think of any others? Maybe, as I said, anti-colonial, anti-racist, anti-fascist and feminist movements. They would all qualify. The marginalized should be the leaders and organizers and spokespeople for their movement. They, this way, they become conscious of their own power, their voice, and who their oppressors are. And they figure out the right strategy for their own liberation. You can read the link in the description for more. Let's make a case study of how our opportunities for solidarity today are squandered. I'm referring to the war on Ukraine. The first thing I noticed was solidarity seemed to mean putting up flags. Because we divide people into groups so that we know how much sympathy to offer them. 
I wondered if all the flags meant solidarity with people or with a nation state. The latter, as it turned out. We were soon flooded with suggestions to punish all people with any affiliation with Russia at all, like deporting students and workers with zero connection to Putin because, you know, Putin claims to rule over the land where they come from, so obviously they're somehow to blame. So they would have to go back to Russia and suffer under the sanctions that will cripple its economy and hurt everyone. They've kicked Russia out of SWIFT and other global payment systems, so artists and anyone else in Russia who relied on payment from outside can't get paid anymore. I'm not here for the punishment mindset at the best of times, but this is collective punishment. Aside from the moral repugnance you should feel at collective punishment, sanctions don't do what they say they do. The stated theory behind this strategy is always to turn the people against the regime. And as a student of history, I can tell you that is not the result of sanctions, and policymakers know it. Sanctions against the whole country are as likely to turn Russians toward Putin as against. Solidarity should mean with people, not with nation states. People are real. They can suffer. They want to be free. Nation states are abstract entities that force you into their social system and demand your allegiance to it. Bringing in refugees helps people. Sending money to resistors helps the resistance. Putting a blue and yellow flag up somewhere does nothing but say you've hopped on the bandwagon. The fact is, most Russians need solidarity too. So did Bosnians 30 years ago, by the way, when there was a genocide going on against them. Which is why it's confusing to hear people on the news say the war on Ukraine is the biggest conflict in Europe since World War II. It's like we've forgotten all about the former Yugoslavia, or just don't include it in Europe. This war is giving us a look at what it means to be a worthy victim. Someone we decide is a victim and therefore deserves our sympathy. You might have heard reporters talking about Ukrainian refugees as if they're special because they're blonde-haired and blue-eyed, implying their whiteness elicits more sympathy than brown eyes and dark skin. You might also have heard about how foreign students and workers were treated at the border when they tried to flee Ukrainian cities. Victor first went to the Polish border with Ukraine to the west, but says he was told by a Ukrainian border guard that the policy was one foreigner allowed through for every 10 Ukrainians. Videos purporting to show foreigners being treated differently by Ukrainian border guards at the long queues going west into Poland something the UN's High Commissioner for Refugees has acknowledged was happening. Is it solidarity to sympathize with and come to the aid of some people affected by a tragedy while excluding others? No, it's racism. I think most racism is unconscious, below the surface, easily denied. Until we choose or are forced to see it for what it is, we don't notice it. It shows up in news coverage, how the news reports, and what it reports, and what it doesn't report. Why doesn't the news tell us about other wars going on? There are even bigger conflicts. Not that we shouldn't be talking about Ukraine. We should, and I'm glad we're hearing about it. But when was the last time we heard what's going on in Yemen? Hundreds of thousands have died there. Millions are in extreme poverty, on the brink of malnutrition and disease, and they can't leave. So why don't we talk about it? Is it because the weapons the Saudis are using to pummel Yemen into total submission were sold to them by the US government? Oh, sorry. And the UK, France, Italy, Canada, Spain, Germany, 
Australia, Belgium, too. How many newspapers in any of those places ever mention the war or its weapons? And, and while it could be, as I'm implying, because of those governments' complicity in the war that we don't hear about Yemen, it might not matter. Even if we knew about the war, not enough people would be keen to let in refugees. You know how I know? Because we heard all about the civil war in Syria, which wasn't started by any of the states selling arms to Saudi. And people still made up all kinds of lies to justify refusing entry to Syrian refugees. Syrians, like Yemenis, are not blonde-haired and blue-eyed enough, so they're not worthy victims. Why have we seen so few refugees from the Congo, or Ethiopia, or Iraq, or Afghanistan, or Palestine, or Myanmar, or any other places people are desperate to escape? So yes, let Ukrainian refugees leave. Let people go where they can be safe. Solidarity keeps things simple that way. At the same time, anything we can do to slow down the war machine would help. People in Russia and Belarus have been protesting their rulers' actions at great personal risk. We could be doing the same to any war-making or war-supporting state near us. That said, Protesting as we know it isn't very effective and a diversity of tactics is needed. If you don't know much about direct action, look it up and maybe check out this video that I made on the topic. So there's a lot to learn and a lot to do, but if we're dedicated and follow solidarity as a principle, we have a chance of winning. And that's this week's video. Now here are a few of the videos I wanted to make this week, but just couldn't get YouTube's permission for.